Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or whatever time it is, wherever you are at. This is, once again, your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald J. Brown, and I'm going to be talking to you today on a fascinating topic that is very much in the news as I speak. And this is space travel, aliens, space exploration, and everything involved with space and aliens and outer space. Well, as usual, our outline is on the left. Uh, the aliens are already here. Some people say you don't even have to go to outer space to find them. Why are Americans so fascinated with space? The importance of space during the Cold War when that became one of the threatening uh, battlegrounds, and more so even today. Aliens, how are we going to respond to aliens when they show up? And I'm not saying if they show up, I'm saying when they show up. Basic fundamental questions that we have to deal with when we talk about space and space travel and aliens, and then confronting the aliens today. They are on their way, or... Many people will say they are already here. Well, I am a great world traveler, as most of you know. And in fact, the picture on the right, you see me in the top of the Andes Mountains, way up at the top in Bolivia on the border with Chile, and exploring a whole new world which is really quite similar to what we would expect the moon to look like or possibly Mars. Very inhospitable climate where it would be up into the 80s and 90s during the day and down to 20 degrees below zero at night. So a great explorer. One of my hopes is that before I die, I will encounter an alien. I will meet an alien. I think that's going to be a fascinating um, experience. So let's get going on our topic for today, space travel and aliens. Well, just a couple of days ago, in fact, a week ago, there was this flurry of activity in the United States because balloons were suddenly discovered floating over the United States and Canada, and they found out later around the world. And everybody was saying, what are these? And so one argument was that they were aliens and that they were exploring and photographing the United States. Well, one was shot down over the coast of um, South Carolina, I believe it was, and it was discovered to have been a Chinese spy satellite. Others were shot down, went over Canada, went over Alaska, which we don't know yet what they were. So aliens might be on their way. Well, we have gone to space, and we have explored the moon so far. We're sending satellites to Mars and far out into the distant um, space. SETI, the um, Institute for Studying Extraterrestrial Intelligence or Life, is actively scouring the sky for signs of life. And a great scientist like Stephen Hawking wrote, to boldly go where no one has gone before. You might know that phrase from Star Wars and other sci-fi movies. But that just shows that humans have been fascinated with space. They have been thrilled uh, with the idea of going beyond and discovering other life forms. So... Space and aliens are once again in the news. Well, many people have argued that the aliens have always been here. In fact, people like uh, Eric von Däniken, a great writer uh, of uh, fantasy tales, argues that the Egyptian pyramids and Stonehenge and all of these other places were in fact signs the aliens had already been here. 
He argues, how could the ancient Egyptians have gotten perfectly symmetrical pyramids? How could in South America the Nazca lines have been carved into a mountaintop? And what were they? He argues that they were a spaceport for aliens. So places like Egypt, Stonehenge, which I was just there um, a number of months ago, Nazca, which I have visited, the pyramids in Egypt, which I have climbed back when you could still climb up on them. And they really do inspire people to say, how could our ancient ancestors have built such phenomenal monuments? And so many people argue, like von Däniken and like um, Savant Hayes, Mike Parker, Pearson, Brian uh, Forster have argued that actually the aliens are already here. Some might say they are still here. Some say they have interbred with early primitive apes and created humans as we know them today. Well, this is speculation. In Palenque and Mexico, um, Sitchin, another writer, says that the stone carvings that you see on the right are actually spaceships or that the ancient Mayas remember their ancestors arriving from outer space, landing, and this was their recreation of what the spaceship probably looked like. So here again, saying we don't have to go to outer space, the aliens have been here and powerfully influenced human history. In fact, many people say that the creation story, Adam and Eve story, which is probably one of the most ancient legends in human history, going back to the Babylonians and the Assyrians, gradually adapted into the Jewish religion and accepted by Christianity and Islam, that actually the God who was doing all this creation in the Bible was actually an alien who came down to earth, started mingling with the ancient creatures who were here, fashioned the human being. In fact, that's what the creation story is of someone from outer space coming down and creating humans, bringing them up to um, intelligence and becoming sentient creatures. The Jewish Bible talks about Nephilim and Giborim. Uh, nobody really knows what these creatures were, but some say that they were from outer space, came down and mingled with the daughters of men, and they bore children. Here again, testifying that humans were created not through evolution, but through the direct involvement of some creature from outer space. In fact, in both ancient Egypt and in South America and Mexico, it was very common for parents, especially of the elite, the ruling class, to take the heads of their children, wrap them in tight cloth, and force the head to grow backwards, such as the one you see in the picture. And one argument is that these was the, this was the shape of the heads of these creatures who came from outer space, and according to the Jewish Bible, had children with our early human ancestors. Now, Today in modern Hebrew, Gibor or Giborim simply means a great hero, but uh, traditionally it has been accepted as some type of superhuman, almost heavenly or de demigods from somewhere in outer space. In fact, this idea of ancient creatures coming from outer space and guiding human history is what lies behind not just the giborim of the ancient times or those who mingled with the ancient ancestors in Egypt and South America, 
but it also inspires the idea of another individual who is going to come in the future. And that's where we get the Mahdi and Islam, the Jewish Mashiach, which also was absorbed from Zoroastrian religion, the first religion to come up with the idea of a Messiah, and now is part of Judaism, Christianity, Islam. And so here again, it is not just in the past, whether it was God who gave instructions to Angel Gabriel to reveal the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad, but even in the future, we still have this hope that a Messiah is going to come. Or in the case of Christians, it will be the return of Jesus, the Messiah. So this image of someone from outer space guiding, influencing human history, evolution, and development is deeply rooted in the human psyche. We see this very much in the movies. For example, exploring space, that somebody is out there and we want to find them, whether it is the famous uh, voyage to the moon of 1902, or Destination Moon, War of the Worlds in the early 50s. These were very much um, movies which were based on the idea that there is someone out there. Call them God, call them angels, call them devils, call them spirits, call them aliens or Martians or lunatics on the moon. This idea that there is something out there that we can discover it either through going to outer space and exploring or that they have already been here. So by going back in history, we can discover them. Magnificent movie, this a Space Odyssey of 2001. Here again, these were apes and gradually they became civilized and became almost human. And the scene on the left at the bottom is very powerful, that the apes discover this obelisk. They don't know where it came from, but it was created by someone, not them. And it teaches them all of the rules for human evolution. Even the Bible story of the Ten Commandments, here again, going up into the mountain, and some creature from outer space revealed these laws. So Space Odyssey is picking up with biblical theme of obelisks and commandments and linking them with space creatures and human evolution. Now, Americans have been especially fascinated by outer space. John O'Sullivan of New York, the journalist, invented the term manifest destiny in 1839, saying that it was the destiny of the United States to spread from the Atlantic coast across the Appalachian Mountains, the Midwest, over the Rocky Mountains into the Pacific. And then what? Well, then it was Alaska, then it was Hawaii, Philippines, war against China in the year 1900, that Americans always had this notion that we were not just a little country, but we were a country with a great destiny. Even the term, the new frontier, as John Kennedy described, space exploration. Sort of the continuation of this American vision of history, of growth, of expansion, of exploration, conquering new worlds, going where no man has gone before. Well, Manifest Destiny began on the East Coast, New York City, spreading west creating the great American empire. Well, of course, Howard Zinn, the great historian, highlighted very much the genocide of the Native Americans, the enslavement of Africans, the 
uh, mass slaughter of people in the Philippines and in Hawaii, overthrowing the government in Hawaii. And today, this continuing notion of it is our destiny to dominate the world. This has inspired American history. And so whether we're taking over California, the Philippines, uh, well, the moon and Mars are the next step in our manifest destiny. The great TV series Star Trek 1966, once again, really plugged into this American myth that we have a great destiny in history. Well, we call it a myth because it's something you believe. Whether you believe that you are the chosen people of God, or whether you believe that you have a great destiny, or whether you are the British and you're going to bring civilization to the world, or the French, the mission civilisatrice, this idea that we have a great destiny and that we are going to take it to space. Space was the final frontier, no longer California or, or uh, Hawaii or the Philippines or Iraq or Vietnam. Our new frontier is now in space. Famous lines, these are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Well, Americans have loved sci-fi. We love the technology of sci-fi, and we love the exploration, the new frontier. So two big themes in American history merge with sci-fi, science and technology, and the myth of the great Frontier. Isaac Asimov, 1920, 1992, wrote book The Martian Way, talking about the encounter with aliens. Magazines like Galaxy Science Fiction, going back to the early 50s. Here again, the golden age of sci fi was deeply an American creation. Robert Heinlein. <clears throat> Again, galaxy science fiction, um, if science fiction, writing about our encounter with aliens, exploring foreign lands and planets. Arthur C. Clarke, one of the great sci-fi writers from Britain, I'm sure the universe is full of intelligent life. It's just been too intelligent to come here. Well, magazines, his collection, 2001 Space Odyssey, based on the novel by Arthur C. Clarke. One of my favorites is Childhood's End, where humanity evolves under the guidance of aliens, and we get to the point where we leave our bodies behind we leave the earth behind and we go off into outer space where we join with the other ancient, highly developed civilizations which populate the universe. So sci-fi, technology, and manifest destiny coming together, but also the conviction that there are other people out there. Now, during the American Cold War, with this comp, uh, competition with the Soviet Union, which dominated my early childhood, 1945-1991. It was the great conflict between the two countries, both of which believed they had a divine destiny to dominate the world. Well, the Red Scare... The fear that the communists just might win the competition with the United States and we would have the communist states of America. Well, part of this competition 
was, of course, the development of the atomic bomb, which the United States used against Japan. But then following World War II, it armed itself, as did Soviet Union, as well as China and Israel and other countries, developing the atomic bomb as a way of defending themselves. And we came very close to atomic warfare in the Korean War, the early 50s, later on the Berlin Crisis, Cuban Missile Crisis, Vietnam War. These were very dangerous times for the two superpowers. The United States was seeing a communist behind every tree, whether it was Che Guevara in South America, Castro in Cuba, Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, China becoming communist. This was a very dangerous time for the United States and for the survival of humanity. Part of this competition was the space race. Both the United States and the Soviet Union, and later on China, realized that we could destroy ourselves here on Earth. We had enough atomic bombs to do it. But the next big area of competition was going to be who was going to control space. Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, shocked the United States. And President Kennedy argued, we must join the space race and we must dominate it. So outer space and inner space became part of the great space race where both countries were out to control space claiming the moon, setting up military um, outposts, circulating the air on uh, satellites. And so the space race was an area that emerged between the United States and the Soviet Union and is even more acute today, as we just saw with this mysterious balloon or three balloons so far that the American government has been shooting down and we still don't know who put them up for sure, but space is the new frontier of exploration and of discovery, but also space is going to be the new battleground, the com competition to control the Earth and to control outer space. So the space race became part of history and the competition. Sputnik went up 1957, very, um, orbiting, sending signals back to Earth. Spy satellites were going up, photographing from space uh, with increasing accuracy, military bases, troop movements, construction sites of new military bases. Time magazine celebrated your Gagarin and the beginning of the new race for space. Even a Tom comic book, such as the one on the right, feature war in space and atomic war even on other planets. Part of this space race was the race to the moon. John Kennedy said, well, the Russians were the first one to orbit. We will be the first ones to step foot on Mars. So not only comic books and books for kids were being published by the thousands, but kids could buy rocket ships. I remember as a little kid trying to build my own rocket ships. Fortunately, they all blew up and fortunately nobody was killed, but it was space where everybody was looking, building, bases on the moon and making the moon part of the battlefields for competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. Well, this 
space race introduced all kinds of new technology, space suits to protect from radiation, to permit people to breathe comfortably, space ships for sailing through the space, space weapons, Star Wars type ray guns, and entire cities built under giant domes to terraform, to make hostile planets habitable. Computers, much we have today, um, emails, internet, all of these were developed as part of the space race, which gradually trickled down and became the laptop I'm using now and became the emails which I send and receive. But this was all new technology developed as part of the space race. Computers. Look at the size of some of these giant things, 1950. Here again, they are gradually being reduced in size. And so now in your cell phone, you can have all kinds of powerful uh, instruments, communications, computations, send, uh, I'm going to Google and using Zoom on a tiny, tiny telephone that can fit in your pocket. And so, the, but in the beginning, these were instruments of war and scientific research as part of the space race. Now, the big question is, when, and I'm not saying if, I'm saying when we encounter aliens, how are we going to respond? Well, when you look at American history, we don't have a very good track record in dealing with the other. What did we do to the Africans? We enslaved and murdered millions. What did we do to the Native Americans? Genocide. And this is not just the United States with our racism and apartheid and segregation, uh, banning um, Chinese immigration. But this is part of human history. When we encounter someone who is different from us, the first reaction is hostility. Think of a little baby sitting on his mother's lap, perfectly happy, passing back and forth between mom and dad and maybe some of the other kids. But when I walk into the room and sit down and the baby takes one look at me, it will very often be afraid. It's a human response. They know the sight and the smell of their parents and the people who are close to them, but I bring a different smell. I have a different face that the child does not recognize. So history has, American and world history, has a very bad track record in dealing with the other. Well, in 1947, there was a crash of something in Roswell, New Mexico. And the, argue, the journalists concluded that it was an alien spaceship. But look at the picture they have on the left, a recreation of it. Number one, the guy is in a mask. The alien is dangerous. Look at his face, not a very happy, welcoming image for these aliens. Well, newspapers were talking about aliens all over the place. Well, the United States, like every other country, viewed the aliens as a hostile force, just like we viewed the communists as a hostile force out to destroy the United States. Well, we started viewing the aliens also as a danger, as a threat. Well, this is the way we viewed the slaves from Africa. This is the way we viewed the American Indians. This is the way white people viewed Africans in South Africa. This is the way the Germans viewed Jews as a danger to be exterminated. Even today, as I speak, people are taking down statues of the firm 
Christopher Columbus taking down Civil War hero monuments because it is reminding Americans of the past which they would prefer to forget. Fascinating movie. The Day the Earth Stood Still, 2008, starring Kenu Reeves, where they have this vast, fascinating conversation. So you've come to help us. Helen Benson asks Klaatu, the alien, and the alien says, no, I didn't. And Helen says, you said you came to save us. And Klaatu says, I said I came to save the earth. And Helen says, you came to save the earth from us? You came to save the earth from us? Radu, we can't risk the survival of this planet for the sake of one species. And Helen responds, what are you saying? Radu responds, if the earth dies, you die. But if you die, the earth dies survives. There are only a handful of planets in the cosmos that are capable of supporting complex life. So here again, you see the complex creation of the relationship between the aliens and the earthlings. What if Plato or aliens come and they decide that the human species should be exterminated? like the Americans did to the Indians, like the Germans did to the Jews, like the South Africans did to the Africans. They are a threat, they are a danger, and to save the earth, human beings must be destroyed. So here again, aliens might view us like so many sci-fi writers viewed aliens as a threat. And so in the film, we see that the aliens come. They see that we are destroying the earth, that we have a genetic defect that makes humans angry, that makes humans kill each other. And that we see every day in New York with somebody getting a gun going into a school or in the subway. We read about people murdering people around the world, genocides in Africa. I mean, an alien could conclude that the human species should be exterminated in a way that we might exterminate the bedbugs in our apartment or the cockroaches. Well, on a global intergalactic framework, maybe humans are a defective species. Well, we view aliens very much the same as Klaatu viewed the humans. And look at the way we portray them in the wonderful film Alien. Look at, they're portrayed as monsters, as reptiles. I mean, not the kind of creature that you could possibly interact with. And so it is very much part of our view of aliens is that they are dangerous, that they are a danger to Earth and a danger to human beings. Well, one of the few movies that portrayed aliens in a positive light was E.T. of 1982. They were nice aliens. Look at, they're all even smiling. They are, once again, interacting with humans. But yet, in the movie E.T., it's not the bigwigs in Washington or at the UN or in Paris or London or Moscow or Peking who are encountering the aliens. The aliens get along with kids. And so the message here is that kids are innocent. They are welcoming and loving. And that the aliens will have more in common with innocent kids than they will with adults. Space Odyssey 2001 argues that, in fact, aliens were our ancestors. 
But here again, the relationship between humans and aliens become complex. The picture on the right shows that, like God in the Jewish Bible, aliens brought laws, they brought evolution, they brought civilization. But Stanley Kubrick in the film by Arthur C. Clarke says, also the aliens taught us to fight. And that's the big scene where one of the apes who is emerging as a early human type takes up a bone and starts smashing the skulls. And then you have the first warfare. So aliens, as Denikin said, taught us a lot of good things. But Arthur C. Clarke is saying, well, maybe the aliens taught us a lot of other things, such as warfare, which introduced that defective gene into the humans, which made them violent, warlike, and genocidal. <clears throat> well, this whole interaction between aliens, whether they're invading us or whether we discover them on another planet, uh, really introduces a lot of very complex questions. Some people say that we emerged from apes and that we inherited our killer instinct from our animal ancestors. And so just as we exterminate the cockroaches in your kitchen, we also exterminated the Indians, enslaved the Africans, and committed other horrendous crimes. Think of all the American crimes in Vietnam, and especially waterboarding in Iraq. And so, sci-fi, space travel, and even these so far fictitious encounters with aliens pose a very serious question. Are we all children of God, lovey-dovey, loving one another, as some religions argue, or are we a warlike creature where we destroy cities and exterminate other people? So while we're talking about aliens and space travel, we're also talking about ourselves, so looking in the mirror and saying, who are we? Also, space travel, sci-fi brings up another serious question of what are we? We tend to think of ourselves as rational, as intelligent. We even, some people even argue that we have a soul, that there's something inside of us which transcends the human body, that we are intelligent, that we are rational. Many religions preach love as being a principle that can overcome the evil instincts in humans. So who are we? What are we? Do we have a soul? Are machines going to become intelligent, become sentient, and become humans? Is this possible? The whole question of space travel and aliens and where did we come from? Bible has the story of gods creating humans. Another theory is we evolved over time. The Jewish Bible in Genesis has direct encounters with aliens and humans. So what is our origin? Are we just animals emerging, constantly evolving? Will this evolution continue? Will we at one point be able to leave these earthly bodies, what one writer calls the bag of water and protein? And will we be able to abandon our bodies and become pure spirits floating around? So where did we come from? What is our history? These are the questions of human origins that religions have been trying to understand 
for thousands of years. Encounter with aliens and space travel is also going to bring up the question, is there any reality behind all of our religions? Are there angels? And what are angels? Is there even a god? Do gods reveal things to people? Um, everybody comes up with a different approach. Probably the most complex view of aliens comes from the Mormon religion, Joseph Smith, levels of heaven and levels of hell. And even after we die, we continue to evolve in another world. Uh, the Rebbe, Menachem Schneerson of the Lubavitchers, the people gather around his tomb until today, waiting for him, who they are proclaimed to be the Messiah, claiming that he is about to rise from the dead and return to the living. Buddhism has totally dispensed with any idea of gods or angels or ghosts. They firmly believe that inside of every human, there is a very positive force that is going to evolve. And if we cultivate it, we can overcome all of our evil instincts. We can get rid of the defective gene that makes humans so evil. So, whole encounter with aliens and space travel is going to pose very serious questions and possibly undermine religions. If we encounter aliens on another planet, are we going to send Christian missionaries to convert them? That's what we did, what Europe did in South America and in Africa and Asia, destroying other religions, other cultures, uh, saying that our religion is the superior one. The whole question of what is human, if, as in Arthur C. Clarke, we do lose our bodies and uh, emerge uh, as pure spirits, uh, is this going to um, question what is a human? Can we exist without a body? Are we linked to the body? We have robots now that can play chess and win at games far better than humans. We're gradually replacing our body with machines. A friend of mine had two hips redone, got two knees redone, has a pacemaker, has an insulin pump, and I told her once, I said, Jessica, one day you are going to be just one machine and all your body parts will be machines. Or, as in many sci-fi movies, we can just upload our consciousness and our mind into a memory stick, take it with us or give it, send it somewhere where we can dispense with the human body. And here again, this is a challenge because don't forget in the um, um, traditional Jewish, Christian, Muslim, um, um, Babylonian and Assyrian accounts, God created the body in his own image and likeness, which means if we don't need bodies anymore and we can email ourselves Someone can email me from Earth to Mars and just give me a temporary body or just upload me to a laptop. Well, are we still in the image and likeness of God? So, so many of our fundamental beliefs, gods, angels, revelation, spirit, soul, encounter with aliens is definitely going to question a lot of our understanding of ourselves. In the film 2001, how the great computer that was charged with a special mission, in fact, tried to take over the spaceship, where um, how stops taking orders from Dave, who's supposed to be in charge, and says, I can't, I'm afraid I can't do that. 
you're again showing that the computer has become equal, if not superior, to a human. One of my favorite movies is AI, Artificial Intelligence, where they talk about a mecha. A mecha is a artificial person who is intelligent, is brilliant, and is, is in a way is more human than biological humans. So when we talk about life, when we talk about ancient other civilizations on other planets and space travel, it's an open question of what we are going to encounter, what kind of creatures these will be, and how will they respond to us? Will they do to us what the Germans did to the Jews, the whites did to the Africans, the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians, the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs? Genocide is part of the human condition. So our myths, chosen people, these visions of heavens and hells, the mind being a unique creation, these are all going to be undermined. Think of Mary Shelley's famous story of Frankenstein creating an artificial human out of parts. So what is it? What does it mean to be human? By encountering other civilizations which are not human, which might be far superior to us or far inferior to us, uh, going to pose major and very serious questions. Also, that will undermine the myth that the Earth is really what it's all about. Even the old maps showed the Earth being the center of the universe with the sun and the moon and the planets, everything revolving around the Earth. Well, Copernicus proved that that was not true, that we were simply one little piece of a rock going around a sun, which was a minor sun in the universe, uh, and that we were not the center of the universe. Humans were not the center of creation. But we will we'll discover eventually that we are just one among probably millions of other creatures and beings. Well, Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic and discovered a whole new continent. And look at how that shaped American history, created new civilizations, and gave new opportunities. Well, our discovery of other civilizations and other planets is going to be just as dramatic. <clears throat> well, in just in case you're getting depressed, um, uh, you might want to stick to the myth of the Messiah, that there is somebody out there, that this person is guiding us and is going to come back, whether it's the Jewish Messiah, the Christian Messiah, or the Muslim Mahdi, um, that, um, you know, everything is going to be solved by some guy floating on a cloud up in heaven. Well, Maybe it's time to uh, get a little bit more realistic and ask, how are we going to deal with uh, other civilizations? Are our myths that we cling to of heaven and hell and gods and messiahs, are they going to be useful in confronting aliens and space travel? Or are they going to go down in history as nice stories uh, and join the horse and buggy in the Museum of Human Evolution. So confronting the aliens is going to be just another chapter in how humans have dealt with the other. As I talk, we are talking, we are now showing how Russians view the Ukrainians, 
how the United States is dealing with the rise of China, danger of atomic warfare, criminal gangs. How are we going to deal with global warming? Everybody wants to keep their standard of living high, but at the same time, we are destroying our planet with um, droughts in the southwest, um, horrendous storms in the middle part of the country, forest fires. Our recent experience with the pandemic of COVID-19 showed that humans are totally incapable of cooperating to deal with a major pandemic. Wars, revolutions are part of our past and present and no doubt future. Religious warfares, if anything, are growing in intensity. Jews and Muslims, Chinese and the Uyghurs, Iran revolution. We just had the return of Netanyahu in Israel, extreme right. We got rid of Bolsonaro in Brazil and his evangelical Christians. But who knows what will happen if Donald Trump's come, Trump comes back and the United States starts persecuting non-Christians and other religious minorities. So as we look into the future, of space travel, and especially encountering aliens, we have to ask, how are we going to deal with them? So dealing with aliens is going to be one of the great challenges facing us in the future, along with the rise of China, dealing with pandemics, global warming, globalization of the economy, globalization of ideas. Hey, everybody's trying to control the internet, control emails, censor the press. So encountering aliens is going to be one of the great challenges of the future. Going where no man has gone before, discovering new civilizations, which will cause us to question our uniqueness even the myth that we were created as a superior species. Currently, we are in a period of political chaos. Donald Trump was and wants to be again the BJP in India, militant Hinduism at war with Christians, Jews, and Muslims. The rise of religious fanaticism in Iran, the oligarchs in Russia, Vladimir Putin linking up with the Orthodox Church on his divine mission. China convinced that it is going to be the Chinese millennium in the future. <clears throat> Will groups of humans ever be able to co cooperate? So what happens when Kladukas comes in the future and threatens to exterminate humans. Will we be able to respond? Will we be able to overcome our hatred, fear, and cooperate? Or is, as Klaatu argues, the human race is defective from birth and should be destroy. Well, a lot is going on. Global migration. How are we dealing with all the Mexicans and other people at the border trying to get into the United States? Global warming. Are we letting our planet be destroyed? How will we deal with the next pandemic? And it's ironic that the United States, with the most expensive and highly developed healthcare system on the face of the earth, was the country that lost an estimated one to two million people because of 
COVID. Another great movie, District 9. What did the white people do to the aliens? They put them in ghettos. And look at again how the aliens are portrayed. Not the kind of person you'd want to take out on a date. Here again, it shows that humans are a defective creature. Uyghurs and Muslims, the Israelis, persecution of the um, Palestinians. Look at these ghetto walls uh, where they dumped millions of Palestinians. Donald Trump, build the wall. China's genocide of the um, Uyghurs in Burma, the persecution of the Rohingya and expulsion. This is what humanity is about. Independence war, once again, aliens are a threat. We must destroy them. So space travel encounter with aliens is going to be a very troublesome chapter in human history. I'm just I just hope that I'm still here when it happens because I want to see how we will respond. But thus far, the human encounter with the other has been largely negative. So I'm not very optimistic about how aliens will view us and how we will view aliens when we get to other planets. So genocide is part of the human condition and that will shape our attitude towards the other. So on that very pessimistic note, let me recommend one other film, Solaris, which is phenomenal. So this is Dr. Ronald Brown logging off. Thank you for joining me. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture. If you have anything you'd like to add, send me an email to ronbrownmedia at gmail.com. So once again, thank you very much. And I shall see you during our next 